Welcome to Bible Meds Soul Medication. Today we arrive at part two, the seal book in the sanctuary, the seven seals of Revelation, the opening of the seals. So before we had an introduction, and it's none other than Carl that will present um, the study. So um, I'm sure you will learn something today. We want to remind people, like all the time, that any citation or article is not ours per se, but for evangelism purposes. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Instagram, or even Facebook, if you want to get also devotional. So before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day as we are about to open the seals. Be with Carl, be with us, and help us to understand that you are the one who's sealing us. Thank you for everything. Be with us, protect us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the seven seals of Revelation, the seal book in the sanctuary, the opening of the seals, part two. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Early, for the intro. So as we saw, we went to the seven churches and we also looked at the trumpets. And when we look at the, the churches and the seals, we see that the dates are approximately, they match. They're pretty close. It's around the same time that the first seal in the you know first church takes place. But of course, it's different for the trumpets. Trump is there's like a 400 year gap and it doesn't start until the time of the church of Pergamos. So we're going to be focusing on the seals for this presentation and um, just kind of go break it down verse by verse, sort of, and to really get the bigger picture of what is the message behind the unfolding of the seals. All right. So as you can see, we saw last week also in the introduction. You know, just like the seven, the candlestick, which um, has the churches, is associated to the churches, the altar of incense with the trumpets. And we also have the seven bowls with the Ark of the Covenant. We have the seven seals that is with the table of shoe bread, which is why last uh, presentation we looked at the high priest and his role in the table of shoe bread. Um, now here's some comments from some of the pioneers of the faith. This is from Uriah Smith. In the seals, we have had the history of the church during what is called the gospel dispensation. And the seven trumpets now introduced, we have the principal political and warlike events which were to transpire during the same time. And Perius, which regards the seals as covering the whole Christian dispensation, the first four signifying by the four horsemen, the successive periods of the apostles, of pagan persecutions, of heresies, of the rise of Antichrist, the six, the judgment and wrath of the Lamb. So just a little summary real quick as we start. All right, so again, um, this is for the horsemen, seeing the white horse here, red horse, black horse, and the pale horse. We're going to spend some time on that. Um, we see that uh, Ephesus with the white horse, Smyrna with the red horse, Pergamus, black horse, and Tyra with the pale horse, where we have, of course, the papacy being established and starting the 1260 year prophecy that we have in Daniel. So as you saw in all four passages, we see the horn, it talks about come and see, you know, when the, the seal is being um, open. Now I just wanted to saw a few other texts where we see the same uh, language in Psalm 66 verses four and five. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Call, come and see the work of God. He is terrible in his doing. 
toward the children of men. And then Isaiah chapter 66, verses 17 and 18, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one, three in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination in the mouth shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. So usually when we have heaven asking us to come and see, it's something that's out of the ordinary. And in this case, we're seeing God's glory. And we're also seeing the terrible, the work that he's doing, which the Bible says is terrible. So we're going to see a little bit uh, what the seals uh, are showing us. Now, we, we covered this in the trumpets, um, but, you know, I think this year around summer, um, we had in Vogue magazine, you know, Beyonce taking pictures uh, on, on a red horse. And we have kind of like this silver horse. And if you look at those pictures on top there with the white horse, as we're going down, you know, we're, we're seeing some places where there's different clothes. So red horse we're gonna see represents the, where we have the horseman with the sword and pieces taken. Are they trying to tell us something, you know? Mm -hmm. Are they trying to show us the time that we're living in? and um what the enemy is trying to do for him to es establish his system his new world order so pretty much called they are reusing this this symbol in history and apply it to their plan and repackaging them exactly all right <clears throat> so we also, and we're going to go back in the Old Testament, you know how we do when we're trying to get a little deeper in the book of Revelation, usually we will try to go back to the Old Testament to get some information that will help us get a bigger picture of what it is that the Bible is trying to show us. So four horsemen, what do we understand by that? In Zechariah chapter one, starting from verse eight, I probably won't read everything. I saw by night and behold a man riding upon a red horse and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom and behind him were the red horses speckled in white then said i O oh my lord what are these and the angel that talked with me said unto me i will shew thee what these be and the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said these are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. And we'll jump to verse 13 and yellow. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I'm very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I'm returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So we're seeing here a horseman, red horse, and they're going to and fro, and they're kind of like reporting to God what they're seeing. It's mm -hmm. like God's messengers, you know, they're, that are going about the earth. And God, of course, he's interested in his people. Jerusalem, remember the table of Shubred, the 12, the, the stack of the loaves, that represented the church. You know, there's nothing else that God is more interested in than his church, his bride. And he's looking at the world to see the conditions and how, what to do to move forward or, you know, whatever it is that, it, that he's trying to do depending on the situation. So that's the one example we see here of, you know, God and horses being used. And also for uh, means universal. So pretty much God is saying, I'm ruling over the whole earth to correct or to 
fix things on yes. my church. Yes. This is, this is, I have authority <laughs> over this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Good. And then in Ezekiel chapter 14, we have another example, starting from verse 13. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trans trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. Verse 21, for thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. So you see yeah. here now we have four sore judgments that are being sent because of what? Because of apostasy, because of trespassing. God is trying to correct them by sending famine, you know, the sword and the noisome beast and the pestilence. So again, all these examples to kind of show us what the four horsemen are, are, are trying to do as God is sending them. So, Carl, are you saying that God is trying to get these people's attention? He's what trying to get people attention, especially because they're in they're in sin. <laughs> There's okay. There, there, there are people that are claiming to be on God's side, but they're not faithful. And mm -hmm. God is sending punishment, is sending things their way to get their attention to try to, to bring them back to the right way. Amen. Amen. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord shewed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift his, up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. Amen. So these carpenters, these horns, they're the ones that caused, you know, Judah to be taken captive, to scatter them from Jerusalem. And now also God is using them to break the horns of the Gentiles or to cast out the horn of the Gentile to allow the Judah to go back home. So you see God also used these four, you know, horns or messengers or, um, to, to do his work, to work on the church, the whether it is to scatter them or whether it is to bring them back. Mm. Yeah, because you, we see here carpentry and, you know, it's, you're doing wood, woodwork. So you must be building something yeah. back up with these four uh, horses. It's good you said that, but because if anyone knows about Zechariah, this is about the time where the plan is to rebuild the temple, you know? Mm -hmm. Rebuild Jer Jerusalem, because it was destroyed after Nebuchadnezzar took everyone, well, all these people into captivity. So now it's rebuilding, especially the temple. That was the priority. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, and we have, I think, one more. These are all different visions that Zechariah had. And I turned, this is in Zechariah chapter 6, and I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. And the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot, black horses, and in the third chariot, white horses, and in the fourth chariot, chrysalid and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Amen. Um, and there's this quote. Um, it says, The Lord's eyes are open to the working of the whole cause of God. So those four spirits, they're like working like God, the Lord's eye, just kind of like how we saw in Zechariah 1 where it's going, those horse, that red horse going to and fro, you know? Um, what I see here, whenever you see four, like especially these spirits, it's always in relation to God's people. 
um, you know, how God is watching over them or watching over the world and how to go about helping them or breaking them, um, depending on what has been done. So I hope all this is helping us kind of understand before we dive in to the different seals of uh, what the four horsemen represent here. Just like the four, uh, the four empires in Daniel, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Exactly. Much. Exactly. That's a good example. And we saw the chariots or the four spirits. And it, I just thought it was interesting in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And of course, that's the same thing that uh, Joash, the king of Israel, said to Elisha when he was about to die. Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof in Second Kings chapter 13, verse 14. And what did Elijah come to do? You know, this was a time with Ahab, which was the king that brought so much apostasy, so much idolatry in Israel. And now there was kind of like a time for revival. And then we had reformation with Elisha, you know. Um, so we're, 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 we're seeing here the chariots, is, that's also their role, is to bring back reformation, try to bring back the church to the right way. Amen. And it seems like, just like your chariot is for battle, you know, I think Proverbs 21, 31. So God is really uh, battling for his people, but also chariot, it seems like also it's like um, you're being escorted to the heavenly places when God used these horses to, um, to see. Exactly, because, you know, when you see chariots also, you think war, because these things are not simple because when Elijah, when he came to give the message, what there was no rain, you know, people mm -hmm. probably lost their crops, <laughs> you know, and not able to feed their family. Mm -hmm. um, so it was not an easy. God really allowed something drastic to happen to get his people's attention. Amen. And yeah, you can see in the text, it says the chariot of Israel. Yes. In both texts. Well, both. All right, so with that, we're going to enter, um, start with the white horse, which is found in Revelation chapter six, verses one and two. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer amen and as we saw this is uh you know remember ephesus which pretty much represents the apostolic church you know mm -hmm. from the time of pentecost when they received the holy spirit and just from there just started spreading out the word persecution happened here then they would move on to the next place and thousands would be converted so you see the conquering and you know, just and when you read the book of Acts, it pretty much tell, tells you during that time, they, they preach pretty much everywhere <laughs> at that mm -hmm. point. Um, it says they had a bow. Genesis chapter 9, verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Now that word bow, the Hebrew word is also translated for bow that is used for hunting, for battle for bowmen, archers. So that white horse with the bow, that can also represent the covenant. So he's going around and spreading the covenant of peace mm -hmm. between you know, all the other people. It started with the Jews first. And when they would reject the message, they would go into the Gentiles. That mm -hmm. was the pattern that they always, always followed, starting with the Jews, going to the synagogues, and of course, persecution would happen when they rejected the message. And then the Gentiles, they did that. And many would, uh, especially on the Gentile side, would, would, would convert. And um, if I can interject a little bit. So you, you realize how God is really uh, hunt, hunting spiritually mm -hmm. the heart of the people. 
And it, it made me think of like Cupid. Like I know it's pagan, but you really God want to pierce your heart with his covenant. He wants to get your attention. He wants mm -hmm. you to show his love for you. So um, I, I, I see a similitude of preaching the gospel and even us, God says, um, you know, when we're going to run, we're going to run with the footmen. And after, we, how can we run with the horses? So as we loving the gospel, as we loving Jesus, we'll be able to run faster to preach that gospel like Jesus was doing in the time of Ephesus. Amen. Amen. And, and to add to that also, you know, a lot of people, when they look at the other three horses, they're saying, oh, the sword, you know, peace, peace being taken out, um, death, famine. And they're like, well, the first one has to be bad too. And so they usually would say it's the Antichrist. But what we don't understand is um, the gospel, you know, it's enmity towards the natural men. You know, mm -hmm. um, so this this is not like a simple thing. You hear the word and it's all lovely. No, we we war against the spirit <laughs> initially. So there's there's a there's a humility that needs to happen. There's a battle that's happening. There's a great controversy that's happening in our mind. You know, I, I remember even myself, you know, there's a lot of things that I had to go back and forth with before mm -hmm. I came down to term and accepted fully. Um, what it is that the Lord, the light that he was trying to shine upon me. So it is, yeah. it is a warfare <laughs> in a way. Yeah. To stay in the, in the battle. Yes. And also, uh, when you said covenant, the token of the covenant, I remember um, David and Jonathan, when Saul was after him, he, he, he didn't trust King Saul anymore. Mm -hmm. But he had a, an archer and he said, if I throw the arrows this way, you'll know you need to run. But if I throw, if my archer throw these arrows this way, you can come back. So the covenant between Jonathan and David was so tight that God was giving instruction to Jonathan, to David, to know what to do in whatever situation without talking to him per se. That, that, that's a good example again. Yep. They had, a, they had a covenant between themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of some reasons that people use that, you know, Jesus here has a, has, a, has a bow and not a sword, just like in Revelation 19, where it says, uh, I saw in heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture deep in blood, dipped in blood, sorry, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fire linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And I'll stop there. And another thing that we can really see this is Christ, is the fine linen, you know, the white. Never do we see, even the Antichrist, never do we see like white. I mean, they might have it, but when the Bible, you never see white associated to to that it's always to christ or to the saints or anything that's related to christ you know Amen. especially in the book of revelation so we might have to make sure we were doing the line upon line and matching everything so that we can come to our conclusion and then in psalm chapter 45 verse 3 it says gird thy sword upon thy high thy tie O most mighty with thy glory and thy majesty we know this is talking about the lord and in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Seeing that there, how, you know, God has uh, 
the heart of the kings in his hand. He's pretty much influencing them um, mm-hmm. to do his bidding. And then Habakkuk chapter three, verses eight, verse eight, it says, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? And then if we just jump to verse nine, thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word. Thou did cleave the earth with rivers. So it is clear that the Lord has not only a sword, but mm-hmm. a bow as well. And they're used differently. The sword, as we can see here, is being used when it's going to war to, to, for separation. Mm-hmm. And, and um, the bow, it's more for covenant or for touching hearts, making them move where he, it is that he wants them to do. And uh, I, I would like to add this right now, like Psalm 127. Mm-hmm. Children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb it is reward. As the arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. So Amen. also in that covenant, in that covenant of bow, we are also being used as his children to reach other people. Amen. So 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 pretty much in, in Psalm 127 is about families and if God will watch over the cities, if the way you teach your kids and they love Jesus, there will be an arrow to pierce other people for the gospel. And that's why the Sabbath and family is really tied together. It will be an arrow to reach other families. That That's a good example. We see Jesus who trained the disciples pretty much like his children and then mm. sent them out. Like go, arrows. Like arrows to go preach, to go present that covenant of peace to others. Amen, amen. Now we have the red horse in in verses three and four. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right. Amen. So we're seeing now there's trouble. There's pieces. There's no peace. And that's what happens when the word is presented and it's not accepted. There's division. Remember the waters? The waters separate. There's a water above. There's a separation that happens. Baptism, you're coming out of that water, coming out of everything you know. You're being separated from the world. But now there's like also tension. Remember mm-hmm. when the apostles, when they started preaching persecution, they had to leave Jerusalem. They had to move. Mm-hmm. When they would go to a city, they would present the message at a synagogue. A lot of Jews were jealous, now trying to persecute them, trying to stir up the people to get them in trouble. We saw that over and over in the book of Acts. So this is a pattern that always happens when the gospel is presented to the people. And there are a group that is choosing to resist. Yeah, and that's why in Hebrews 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharpened than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow, it is discern of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Amen. That's a good one. So it's really um, God needs to know where you're standing at this point. Amen. So we have uh, from Stephen Askell a comment. The gospel of Christ brings peace on earth. But when men fail to receive the truth, it brings sword and bloodshed. Wow. This carries us to the period known as the triumph of paganism corresponding to the Smyrna church. In the eyes of the world, the experience of God's people to his, this age was on one of the great of great defeat. But in the eyes of him who has power to give victory in the smallest things of earth and to bring to naught things that are by things that are not, this experience was a triumph. Remember Smyrna, this was one of the churches that did not receive a rebuke. 
you would yep. not dare say that you were a Christian in that time and not really be about it because you know mm -hmm. you were going to get persecuted. The church was kept pure during that time, but to severe persecution. The very witness borne by the sacrifice of the lives of the saints became seed that sprung up and bore fruit. God's infinite power is made manifest in every sacrifice made by men upon earth, and their utter helplessness laid their strength. It was then that the power of Christ rested upon them. Even the smallest act performed in behalf of Christ multiple, multiplies not only a hundredfold in this life, but its influence like a stone thrown into a smooth surface of water extends until it reaches the ocean of eternity. I just thought that was well put, and I hope that makes sense to others. And, you know, there's a lot of parallels you can make with Matthew 24. Um, and we see in verse 6, it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So what is God doing here? All these things, these horses that are being sent, the judgments that are coming, God is still trying to find a way to get more people in the truth. You know, because mm -hmm. as, as those martyrs are dying, people are, seeds are being planted. They're saying, wow, mm -hmm. these people are willing to go through this tribulation and still stand. And more people are getting converted into the church. So God is doing a special work. But the enemy as well, as he's trying to establish his own system, we're seeing these same similarities happening. So he can bring all the world together and have a new system, a new world order. You know, we have the war with Ukraine and, and, and uh, Russia. We have the rumors of wars. We have China um, with uh, Taiwan, mm -hmm. the United States trying to um, get involved as well. And, and what happened in Ethiopia back in 2020, so many things happening. But what is what are all these things doing? They're bringing countries close together. You know, now many more countries in Europe want to associate with NATO because now they don't mm -hmm. want to be bullied by Russia. All these things which are a result of the war. So the enemy is, like we've said many times, everything he does, he has to copy, but it's to establish his own system. And that anyone that's not choosing to fall in line, he can bring fear upon them and get them in line. Wow. So pretty much, even though the these horses were part of the your historicism uh, format mm -hmm. is local format of what's happening right now also yep. uh, that you can apply because the enemy is also trying to get these four horses symbols and hijack them. Exactly. Much. Exactly. But God at the end, he's trying to get people to be awake. And from the pandemic, a lot of people are seeking and trying to find out what's going on. Because if you go all the way to, you know, to the end, mm -hmm. to the seal number seven, pretty much is God coming down and taking his people and starting his own kingdom. Mm -hmm. So that's the plan with the enemy, is to shake up the world, get everyone united, and then his, his world order, his new system. Can come. Can come. So in Revelation chapter six, verses five and six, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Amen. So we know these are symbolic of the famine as we see the black horse, we had the white horse at first. Now we have the black horse. There's darkness. And it makes sense because this is Pergamus. This is at a time where a lot of heresy are coming into the church. You know, so the mm -hmm. word of God is very scarce. It's not, it, it was, it's not like it was before. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to find truth. Mm -hmm. Very, it's filled with darkness right now in, in the church that is being elevated by Constantine. 
so that they can have peace and not keep on suffering persecution. And they definitely received a lot of rebuke, unlike Smyrna. Mm -hmm. How rapidly the work of corruption progress, progresses. What a contrast in color between this symbol and the first one, a black horse, the very opposite of white. A period of great darkness and moral corruption in the church must be denoted by this symbol. By the events of the second seal, the way was fully open for that state of things to be brought about, which is here presented. The time that intervened between the reign of Constantine and the establishment of the papacy in AD 538 may be justly noted as the time when the darkest errors and grossest superstitions sprung up in the church. It is seen by this how paganism was incorporated into Christianity and how during this period, the false system, which resulted in the establishment of the papacy, rapidly rounded out its full outlines and ripened into all its deplorable perfection of strength and stature. So we see this is all the result of not wanting that covenant of peace that Jesus mm -hmm. has to, wants to offer to the people. And now it's creating a new system. And again, in Matthew chapter 24, we also have the warning at, that there shall be famines. So we know the enemy is going to use all these things as well to set up his system. And, we're, and isn't it interesting that all these things that we're covering Within the past couple of years, we've experienced them somehow. No matter mm -hmm. where you're living, the whole world is experiencing some type of famine. The prices are going up. It's so different from so different from what you used to buy and how much it costs. Like the prices are inflated. The gas, everything. The gas. We're we're, we're definitely feeling it. Psalm 105, verse 16. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. So you see, breaking the staff of bread, it's associated to a famine. Now in Leviticus 26, verse 26. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, the famine, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. And what, what will they do? They shall deliver you your bread again by weight. Remember, a measure for a penny, measure of grain, or three measures of barley for a penny. And, by, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied, because it's not enough. Moreover, wow. he said unto me, son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread that they in, in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment. When you don't have enough, you have to measure what you're taking that they may want bread and water and be ast astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. Amen. So if you guys know the a penny, that was a, 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 a person's wage after a day worth of work. Mm -hmm. and so in the measure, that was the amount that someone ate in a day. So whatever you made, you were only able to buy for yourself. So that pretty much showing how expensive these things were back then. So wow. it's really a representation of the famine and of uh, prices that are skyrocketing. Uh, Ilya, did you want to read this part? Yeah. So um, Amos 8 5 saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn and the Sabbath? that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balance by deceit. Uh, also Proverbs 6, 26, by the means of a wish, wish woman is brought a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So, we, we're pretty much seeing here that that famine is going to come also with worship. Because here, the people of God want to end the Sabbath so they can set forth wheat. 
and, and sell it, but with falsifying balance by deceit. So pretty much, I know maybe some of them, some of us were Christian and kept the Sabbath. When we were young, sometimes you want the Sabbath to end so you can play video games or watch a movie. Hmm. But here you, you, you have the symbol of merchandise. That's like Lucifer wants to sell you something more than the sealing message, more than the Sabbath. And when you end the Sabbath, you're falsifying the balance. So you're cheating people so to maintain your own life. So pretty much in the end of time, we're going to see people from the church or from other people who's going to falsify their balance so they can survive. I don't care if I'm trampling on you so I can survive. And the spiritual application of Proverbs 626, you see that orish woman. So with Carl presenting the black horse, you see now the papacy is entering the church full blown, you know, 530, 508, 538. And now that warish woman, because you didn't want the white horse, now you have a piece of bread, a piece of the gospel. So that's me, because you put the gospel so low that you even under you don't even understand the gospel the way you used to. So we, you know, we need to be careful um, how we um, approach the gospel and not put it aside. And also the Sabbath tie also with the table of shoe bread, the bread of face. So are, are, are you happy to stay in that rest with God and God will provide for you? So. Amen. I can. Yep. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off because they refuse to break his law and obedience to earthly powers. They will be forbidden to buy or sell. Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. So we, we see the economic forum, what they're saying here. You're not going to own nothing. This is the plan. That's a famine. Because if you don't own anything, you're depending on a system that will provide you things. Mm -hmm. But just enough. So that means you, you, you will have enough bread just for you. Because, you know, in the carbon footprint, that's the plan. is to really give you enough so I can control you. So I can force the worship of the beast. Exactly. So buying and selling will be very important. And that's why you need to depend on Christ, the bread of faith, the one that's providing the bread to you. So when the crisis come, you connected with the divine and not with earthly power the way you used to. So we are about to change from a system to another system. So we need to rely on jesus right now amen amen yeah and um if you look at this section where do you find the sabbath is really the fourth commandment but what are you trying to bring sunday climate the green sabbath so they really want to bring zero carbon footprint to really control the people because you remember the Israelite, we need to take twice of the manna on Friday so they be able to worship. But this time it will be Sunday. So Satan is trying to say, you don't need to owe anything. I'll provide for you unless you worship on Sunday. So Sunday is the mark of the beast. According to even the Catholic Church, they say that's the mark. So here, we're going to see a system that's going to create famine with the black horse, forcing people to give up their rights, and it will attack the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. 
nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor nothing that is your neighbor. So the connection between the fourth commandment and the 10 commandment is when you have Jesus, you share. And when you share, you don't need to cover because God is giving you stuff. Amen. But here, with the new system, with the zero carbon footprint, they will come and take our stuff. You will not own nothing. So you see how they're breaking the fourth commandment and the 10 commandment. The thief come not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I come that you may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. So God from the white horse was always his plan to help us. But because we went in apostasy, went to the red horse, to the black horse, and God is trying to shake up our life to, to come back to that purity of the gospel. And when we get to share like that, it's working out your character. You Amen. Know, when we're choosing to die to self and give to those that don't have, that's giving us opportunities to work our character. So when everyone has the same thing, then you're taking away that that uh, opportunity, possibility. That, that, that possibility, pretty much. And uh, if we can continue in that same aspect, so we saw that Amos 8, 5 about the Sabbath, they couldn't wait for the Sabbath to end so they can do trafficking. They can buy and sell. So in these last days, we might see a lot of people in the church that love the Sabbath, but because things are rising up, I'm going to help myself. Jesus, I have kids, I have stuff, but I'm not going to let them die. So all that time, you didn't have a strong relationship with the bread of face that you could see him in your trial. So so here in Nehemiah 13, 17, and 19, then I contended with the noble of Judah and said unto them, what evil things is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your father thus and did not our, our God bring all the evil upon us and upon the city? Yet he bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gate should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. So you see, after the Sabbath, you can do your transaction and don't cheat the other people because, you know, next week I might not have enough bread in my fridge. So I'm going to put interest on my neighbor. So all these things. Um, after the Sabbath, you still need to be true. You need to have the true witness character. And some of my servants said at the gate that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the climate lockdown, what's coming is they're going to force people on Sunday to show that's the seal. That's the seal of God, but it's going to be the seal of Satan. Because nowhere in the Bible you can prove Jesus changed the Sabbath. So they're going to trample on the true Sabbath, just like Isaiah 8, 5, and they're going to replace it with the false one because they're going to say it brings catastrophes on the land. So they're going to put climate change on Sunday to say we need to keep that day instead. Yeah. I hope it's clear. And then Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The famine is most also going to be spiritual, not just mm -hmm. physical. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. So remember, we have six 
a stack of bread on each row, 66 books of the Bible. Um, so this is representing how the word of God is going to get to a point where it won't be available as available as it, it is right now. And that's why this is a time where we gather bread just like Joseph as much as we can. Because mm -hmm. when the time of famine comes, there's no more gathering. It's whatever you've stored. And, and, and God said, six days thou shalt labor. So you need to get the spiritual bread, not only the physical job that you're getting, that you get, you went to school for, mm -hmm. but you need to spend time. So when the system is failing you with your profession, you're in the new system of God already switching because the whole system right now, they want to reset it. Exactly. So pretty much Jesus is going to have his own reset where we're going to have to be fully dependent on him. And the reason why we're adding this is that a lot of people focus on the physical. That's what happened with Israel. Remember John chapter six, you know, he's telling them to eat his uh, bread, eat his, his flesh, drink his blood, thinking mm -hmm. that he was talking physically. They were more focused on the manna. Jesus was trying to bring them to the spiritual if you're just spending your time trying to store money, trying to save money so that you can have enough for when the system crash, but how are you going to be able to stand though if you have no spiritual food? Hmm. You'll you, give up. So you have to be like Elijah pretty much. You have to be like Elijah. Be able to wait on the Lord. The raven came, the widow came, and then when he went to the mountain, he was fed. So he was, at this point, spiritually spiritually fed and physically fed so at this point he totally trusts and totally dependent on god amen, amen. And now we have the last horse the pale horse which is the fourth seal and when he had opened the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see and i looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, with the beast of the earth. Amen. And we're going to see what all that means. The color of this horse is remarkable. The color of the white, red, and black horses mentioned in the preceding verses are natural, but a pale color is unnatural. The original word denotes the pale of yellowish color that is seen in blighted or sickly plants. A strange state of things in the professed church must be denoted by this symbol. The rider on this horse is named death and hell. The grave follow with him, follows with him. The mortality is so great during this period that it would seem as if the pale nations of the dead had come upon the earth and were following in the wake of this desolating power. The period during which the seals applies can hardly be mistaken. It must refer to the time in which the papacy bore its unrebuked, unrestrained, and persecuting rule, commencing about AD 538 and extending to the time when the reformers commenced their works of exposing the corruption of papal systems. And this is what uh, Uriah Smith believed. And the, the pale horse was an indication of still greater departure from the spirit of truth than the black one. Thousands have been put to death by the sword, by starvation, and by wild beasts. And what is worse than killing the body, many more have suffered spiritual death because of the hiding of the word of life. So this is really a time where a lot of people were dying um for any for just not believing in how the papacy was running whenever you went against against them you were considered a heretic and wow. death was the punishment and the word of god was kept from the people only a priest could interpret the bible could read it which is why the word dark ages came about the expression dark ages came about so it was a deep famine 
that will bring you to death, spiritual death. Exactly. And also that pale, they're also saying it represents, it can represent sickness, the pestilence, the disease that would follow from all that famine also, not eating for that long. So pretty much God is as the science in the, in the Bible, that's called true science, you know, but Satan has a false science, mm -hmm. you know, in, in doctrine, in even drugs, all these things, he's teaching people different things because they left the white horse. It was killing. Now the, there's mischief with the black horse, there's famine. And now because they've been away for so long from the word, now they're completely dying from, from, from a lack of knowledge totally. Amen. Amen. And it's interesting that they're talking about death during that time, because during that same period, there was this great famine. It was mm. most of Europe was affected. The famine caused many deaths over an extended number of years and marked a clear end to the period of growth and prosperity from the 11th to the 13th century. And like we said, the majority of Europe experienced massive crop failure. Just prior to this, there was a period of population growth triggered by an expansion in agriculture. And the sudden lack of food for the large number of people led to a famine. About five to 12% 12, 12 of the population of Northern Europe died wow. from starvation or related disease. So there was a literal like time where people were just dying during that seal in Europe. Hmm. And there's a little, a, bit like, a little bit like the pestilence in 19, that after that, after that, we had the war, Ukraine, mm -hmm. all these things. But now you see people, you see farmers are going away. And now you see the starvation is coming. Exactly. So just like a repeat. Exactly, because on top of the Great Famine, we'll see in the next uh, slide, there's also this plague called the Black Death, which was the second great natural disaster to strike Europe during the late Middle Ages, and it estimated to have killed 30% to 60% of the European population, as well as about one third of the population of the Middle East. The wow. plague might have reduced the world, the world population from 475 million to 350 to 375 million in the 14th century. Wow. Wow. Was real. That is clearly <laughs> this Tragic. was a matching prophecy. Mm -hmm. And you know, just like Matthew 24 says. Verse seven, you know, not only there were, there's going to be famine and pestilence, just like you said earlier, we're seeing these things being repeated mm -hmm. right now. They're following the same pattern, and it's all bringing us into that new world order. Now we have Revelation chapter six, verses nine to eleven, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Amen. So we just went to the four horsemen, we see the white horse with the covenant of peace. And then when rejection happens, we have the red horse with the sword and uh, peace being taken away. Um, division, we have the black horse with the famine, and then followed by, by the pale horse, which with the death with the pestilence. So now throughout all of this, many of God's righteous uh, men, the, his saints, lost their lives. 
And it's pretty much, did we go to all of this in vain? <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, we, we stood for you. We believed in you. Even when we looked crazy, mm -hmm. we kept pushing for you, Lord. Is there no justice? It seems consistent that this seal, like all the others, should cover a period of time. And the mm -hmm. date of its application cannot be mistaken. Following the period of the papal persecution, the time covered by this seal would commence when the Re Reformation began to undermine the anti-Christian papal fabric and restrain the persecuting power of the Romish church. So one thing that the Reformation brought, not only was it bringing in truth, but it slowed down the persecution a lot. Mm. Because many nations now started like saying, oh, we don't have to keep following the papacy anymore. Because before, mm -hmm. you know, all the papacy had to say is, well, if you don't follow us, you're going to lose your salvation. And many people were afraid of that. But now when the reformers are coming and they're saying, no, this church is an apostasy. They're like, oh, so I don't have to follow the papacy anymore. Mm -hmm. So many countries like England, they started breaking away from the, uh, the rule of the papacy. And persecution on the people were not as bad, especially God's people at that time were started definitely to reduce compared to before. So this was even happening before 1798, where it started to slow down. And we saw that in Revelation 17. And just like this, that blood that we saw, and I, it just reminds me of Revelation chapter 17, verse six, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. I mean, it just shows you how Satan just hates mm -hmm. the truth and anyone that chooses to stay faithful. And it's not over. Mm -hmm. It is urged that these souls must be conscious for they cry to God. This argument would be of weight were there not, were there not no such figure of speech as personification. But while there is, it will be proper on certain conditions to attribute life, action, and intelligence to inanimate objects. Thus, the blood of Abel is said to have cried to God from the ground. The stone cried out of, of the wall, and the beam out of the timber answered it. Habakkuk 2.11, the hire of the laborers kept back by fraud cried. And they then the cry entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, James 5 4. So the souls mentioned in our text could cry and not thereby be proved to be conscious. So what what is what is being said here? A lot of people say, Well, there's there's um these people already died and they're still crying out in heaven. But what what it is, we saw that same example with Abel. His blood, his blood was crying out, but he was dead. He was not conscious. It's just a, a, a figure of speech that the Bible uses trying to show that justice still needs to happen. And God hears these people. You know, it doesn't mean that these people are conscious or alive mm -hmm. at the moment. It's, the Bible uses that all throughout the Bible with the blood crying out from the blood of Abel all the way down to um, all those that were martyred for the truth. Yeah, so so pretty much, Carl, God remembers. He he has a record of this innocent blood that, that was shed. Exactly. So from, even, it, 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 even for David, you know, that killed Uriah, God, God said, Nathan, yes. I, know you, I know you killed that man. So the sword will not leave your house. So you see that God is every people you kill, God remembers. He he's a just uh, he's just king, and he's not going to leave his people like that. Amen. And that's what we see in seal number five that he remembers. And um, it said that in Revelation 6, verse 11, it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season 
until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You know, so there's more that are to come. You wow. Know? And, but all of them are going to be part of that great multitude that we see, that we saw in Revelation chapter 7 in the presentation, 144,000, which also they're going to be given a white robe. All right, so now, Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Follow us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, who shall be able to stand. Amen. This inner life history, as revealed by the opening of the seals, was not for the benefit of those who lived during the period in ecclesiastical history, when it was especially applicable, for at those times the prophecies were not understood. But it is for those who live in the time of the end, especially under the sixth seal, which, which is talking about us right now. Mm -hmm. And the wondrous love of him who ruleth in the heavens may be read in the events which occur. The sixth seal covers history until the end of time. Therefore, the generation now living will witness at least some events shown to the prophet when this seal was opened. It differs from the first four seals by showing events which mark prophetic time rather than by showing the condition of the church. So we're seeing some difference there. And it's just saying, you know, this is from and all these signs that we're going to read about. We see them in Matthew 24, and I believe we also see them in the trumpets, you know, with the, with the, the earthquake and the mm -hmm. sun becoming black and the stars of heaven falling onto the earth. Now, the great earthquake, of course, which was, was the great, a great earthquake, which probably was the great earthquake at Lisbon in 1755, in which 20,000 persons were killed. Wow. The, Encyc the Encyclopedia Americana states it extended from Greenland to Africa and America. Estimates place the death toll in Lisbon at between 12,000 and 50,000 people, making it one of the deadliest earthquakes in history. The earthquake accentuated political tensions in Portugal and profoundly disrupted the Portuguese empire. So we see like, depending on where you're looking at, there are different statistics on how many people died. The mm -hmm. event was widely discussed and dwelt upon by European enlightenment philosophers and inspired major developments in theodicy. As the first earthquake studied scientifically for its effects over a large area, it led to the birth of modern seismology and earthquake engineering. Because of that earthquake, they wow. had to start studying these things because hmm. it was so bad. And now we have the sun become, became black as sackcloth of hair, which was the same as the darkening of the sun that we see in Matthew 24, 27, and was fulfilled in the wonderful dark day of May 19, 1780. The moon became as blood. The night following the dark day, the moon, when visible at all, looked like blood. Hmm. So these were the signs that were happening as uh, we see. And then the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, which is the same as the falling stars of Matthew 24, 27, like we said, and had a wonderful fulfillment in November 13th, 1833, in Leonid's star shower as described by John, 
of which thousands now living or during that time were eyewitnesses. So we see all these signs have already been fulfilled. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, it says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the tree, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So we know that we just read from chapter 6, the sixth seal. We read from all the signs, and we see also how the, the heaven is going to roll back we're going to have that great earthquake kind of showing the coming of Christ. But before that happens, we realize that the ceiling has to happen first, that it, even though it's in chapter seven. But mm -hmm. look at here, it says, till we have sealed the servants of our God, we can't let all these things come to pass. So we know that it's in between that the, the ceiling is happening after these signs that we just read. And you know, this is just a quick review because we really looked at the ceiling already, but we're familiar with the term seal in connection with legal documents. As we saw, whenever a king was sending a commandment, he would always seal it. So the seal was always attributed to a law, to a commandment of some sort, just like we saw in the book of Esther and like we saw in books of uh, the, the kings, you know, they would always seal it so that it would go to the right person. Seals are attached to laws and legal documents. Therefore, we should look for God's seal to be attached to his law. That's why the seal will only come on those that have the Ten Commandments. Wow. So if you don't have the Sabbath, you're not complete. Mm -hmm. You cannot be sealed. When God is sending, a when, when kings were sending messages or people in high position, and they were selling it, it, it had a full commandment on it. God has 10 of them. If you're not mm -hmm. reflecting those 10, you cannot have that seal. Wow, and, and it made me think of uh, <clears throat> the pioneers when they were studying the Millerite message to come to 1844. <clears throat> it was called the trumpets. They were preparing the way for people. Mm -hmm. And after we enter the day of atonement in 1844 but we we still know now that in 1848 we discovered the sabbath so the document in jewish uh, background the the rosh hashanah the, the trumpet it's called be in the book and after the, in the day of atonement be sealed in the book so mm. the aspect of keeping the Ten Commandments in the judgment and keeping the Sabbath, that's how the sealing will happen. So the trumpet and the uh, Yom Kippur, that will be sealed in the book. And after you can tabernacle with Jesus. That's a good point. Cause like, like you said, a lot, some people would say the, those 10 days of the Feast of Trumpets is like the Ten Commandments. Mm. After that you're sealed. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Amen. Thank you for adding that. Um, so we, we all know Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. This must refer to a work of reviving in the minds of the disciples some of the claims of the law which had been overlooked or perverted from their true meaning. And this in the prophecy is called sealing the law or restoring to its seal, which has been taken from it. Amen. So this is this is pretty clear. Like the bind up, this was to to the pioneers. This was a prophecy, and if God is saying to bind up the testimony and to seal the law, that means at some point it got lost. That they have to seal it now. Amen. Here, the Lord tell His people that the very object of their keeping the Sabbath, that is observing the fourth commandment was that they might know that the law was the true, that he was the true God. This is the same as if the Lord had said, the Sabbath is a seal. On my part, it is the seal of my authority, the sign that I have the right to command obedience. On your part, it is a token that you take me to be your God. So I know we've uh, looked at this in previous presentation, but I just really kind of like want to summarize this to show how the sabbath 
is really the seal of the Lord. And when you choose to observe the Sabbath, it is the only commandment that's showing which God you're serving. And all the others, it's different. So who's, who's able to stand? Just like we saw, now we touched on the ceiling, Revelation chapter 6. We're going to go to verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All right? Now, keep that in mind. In Isaiah 54, verse 10, it says, For the mountain shall depart, and the hills be removed. But look what will not depart. My kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that have mercy on thee. Now, the, the word remove in Hebrew is really shaken. So this can be read, nor will my covenant of peace be shaken. Hmm. So when everything is going to shake after that great earthquake, guess what thing will not be shaken? The covenant that was accepted with the white horse, that mm. covenant of peace, that's what's going to stay. So only those that are choosing to keep that covenant will not be shaken out. Mm. Amen. When God comes. Verse 15, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves and the dens of the rock of the mountains and said to the mountain and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him so they don't they don't want to see his face the face mm -hmm. that we are being called to look upon six days mm -hmm. to keep on beholding his glory so if you're not doing that work on a day uh, every week Yet you're going to be part of those people that do not want to be a, see his face at the end and try to hide from him. So pretty much, Carl, you're saying when we do our devotion, his face is there because we are inspired by reading the word and drinking his word. And now you're like, whoa, it's really changing me. Amen. And I, to the point that your face will be lit up just like you're looking at Christ, even though we don't see him, but partaking of the word will help us to reflect that and that peace. Amen. And that it, remember, like we said in the introduction, the same experience that Moses had. That's what God is looking for you. He doesn't want you at the foot of the mountain. He doesn't want you yep. midway. He wants yep. you all the way at the top. Amen. 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 The judge of all the earth is soon to arise and vindicate his insulted authority. The mark of deliverance will be set upon the men who keep the God, who keep God's commandments, who revere his law, and who refuse the mark of the beast or of his image. So I know we're going to go to a time where we're going to ask, God, are you there? But God, mm -hmm. the judge is here. And he's waiting for that moment. Michael is waiting for that time where he can stand up and take and, and avenge his people. Mm -hmm. we, we're yeah. going to have to remember that because it's going to be very tough. Now, in regard to the coming of the Son of Man, this will not take place until after the mighty earthquake shakes the earth. After the people have heard the voice of God, they are in despair and trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And in this, the people of God will suffer affliction. The clouds of heaven will clash and there will be darkness. Then that voice comes from heaven and the clouds begin to roll back like a scroll. And there is the bright, clear sign of the Son of Man. The children of God know what that cloud means. So you see, only the children of God knows what it means because they've been beholding him. They know the sign. Amen. 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 Next. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heaven is one clear space of indescribable glory. 
Whence comes the voice of God, like the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. That voice shakes the heaven and the earth. There is a mighty earthquake, such was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. In Haggai 2, verses 6 to 7, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill his this house with glory, save the Lord of hosts. And let me know this is talking about with the second temple, but you're seeing that same picture again at the end time. Silence in heaven. Now this is seal number seven. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Revelation chapter eight, verse one. Now let's go to the Old Testament to see some examples of silence. Zephaniah chapter one, verse seven. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. So when that day is coming, He's saying to hold thy peace, be silent. For the Lord had prepared a sacrifice, he had bid his guests. And then in Zechariah chapter 2, starting from verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, save the Lord. So he's coming, and look what, mm -hmm. in verse 13, Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Amen. So you see, when God is coming, because you're in awe, because you're just, you, you become quiet, you become silent, because he's coming. The day of the Lord is at hand. Great Controversy, page 65, 641, paragraph 1. Before his presence, all faces are turned into paleness. Upon the rejectors of God's mercy falls the terror of eternal despair. The, the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Jeremiah 36 and Nahum 2.10. The righteous cry with trembling, who shall be able to stand? The angel's song is hushed, and there is a period of awful silence. Then the voice of Jesus is heard saying, my great is sufficient for you. The faces of the righteous are lighted up, and joy fills every heart. And the angels strike a note higher and sing again as they draw still nearer to the earth. What a contrast here. Like one group, they're scared out of their mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another group, they're just so happy because finally they know they can rest. It's over. Wow. Wow. Amen. 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 So that's why we have to behold him now to have that confidence so we can act like this. The way we show that we believe is by preparing. Amen. Most people want last minute, I'm going to jump. But you show faith by preparing. When you don't see any evidence of what you're doing right now, you don't really see it. You're studying your word. You're waking up. Oh, that's great. It makes you feel good. But you really going to see it in the crisis. Oh, this is why I was doing this. Amen. You gathered oil. Gathered oil. And just like we saw silence, we saw the silence. We covered that as well in the 144,000 in Gethsemane. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces. His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. No heart was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched their father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved son. They would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. So you see, silence mm -hmm. is always followed by judgment. You know, mm. Jesus is feeling the wrath. So now there's silence happening right now because mm. God is removing himself from his son because of sin. 
Amen. Amen. The sound of music is heard, and as it nears, the graves are open and the dead are raised, and there are thousands of thousands and ten thousand times ten thousands of angels that compose that glory and encircle the Son of Man, those who have acted the most prominent part in the rejection and crucifixion of Christ came forth to see him as he is, and those who have rejected Christ come up and, and see the saints glorified. And it is at that time that the saints are changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So you see, God is going to allow these people to see those that they killed to see them being changed, that they made the right choice. Amen. And are caught up to meet their Lord in the air. The very ones who place upon him the purple robe and put the crown of thorns upon his brow and those who put the nails to his hands and feet look upon him and bewail. And this is the very sign of the coming of the son of men. When I read this, what it makes me think about when the centurion, he saw Christ and he's like, truly, this is God. This is the mm -hmm. son of God. So all these other guys that were there participating, nailing Jesus, the spirit was probably trying to touch them as well. Amen. Yep, I'm sure. And they, they resisted. And only one admitted what, who he really was. Because his character, you can you could just not disregard his character. He, it was just pure, pure love. Innocent. Anyways, this was our presentation. Hope you were blessed. As you can see, yes, we're going to go through times of trouble. Mm -hmm. But the Lord is going to vindicate our name at the end. Are we Amen. willing to endure? Because only those that are willing to endure will sit next to him and have receive a crown of life amen so and as I, long as we can hold on to that promise we will go very far go ahead Eli. and also when when you're reading the time that the saints are changed in a moment it's like the final baptism glorification like you are changed amen for so all that time you were on this earth you are going through it god was working your sanctification at this point, but this time you are completely changed. The last change of your character. And it's now, over. <laughs> it's over. You you seal, you you seal in the book Amen. at the day of atonement. So Amen. praise God. Amen. All right. Hope you are blessed. Sweet promises given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, mine own to receive. Hold fast till I come, the danger is great. Sleep not as do others, be watchful and wait. Hold fast till I come, sweet promise of them. The kingdom restored to you shall begin. Come and turn my joy, sit down on my throne. Bright crowns are in waiting. Hold fast till I come. We'll watch unto prayer with lamps burning bright. He comes to all others, a thief in the night. We know he is near, but know not the day. As spring shows that summer is not far away. Hold fast till I come, sweet promise of the kingdom restored to you shall begin. Come enter my joy, sit down on my throne. Bright crowns are in waiting, oh, fast till I come. Yes, this is our hope, tis built on his word. The glorious appearing of Jesus our Lord. Of promises all it stands as the sum. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come, sweet promise of heaven. 
the kingdom restored to you shall begin. Come enter my joy, sit down on my throne, bright crowns are in waiting, hold fast till I come. Thank you, Carl, for this presentation. I think it was very clear, the opening of the seal. And that at this time that we need to be in the book and we need to be sealed in the book in the Day of Atonement. And God is doing this work right now. So accept his work so you can be found with him when he comes. So let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this presentation of the seals. We want to behold your face in the morning and at night. And at noon, so you can reflect you throughout. So when you come, we won't run. We won't hide in the rocks, but we'll be able to look at you face to face, just like Moses did. Thank you for this presentation. Help someone right now to behold Christ. Thank you for everything. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching.